All right, so looks like we have a lot of people who've joined. We'll lecture for a little bit and then I will take roll to see who is here. So we're continuing on with the endocrine system today. So I'm gonna go ahead and get that showing for you. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. There we go. Okay, so just so you know, the, the lecture, this is the same exact lecture that is on Canvas, so you can use this for studying, which I would recommend. And any of the links for videos are either in the module section or embedded into the lecture itself. Okay, so please make sure you use those resources. They're going to be really helpful for you. <clears throat> okay, so what we last talked about was down regulation and up regulation. Those are important concepts. Make sure you remember them. Oh, sorry. Okay. I need more coffee. Now we're going to talk about membrane bound receptors. Okay. So a receptor is a protein with a receptor site outside the cell. So extracellular is outside the cell. So hormones that are not able to pass through the plasma membrane bind to receptor on the plasma membrane. And you have this perfect, it has to be a perfect fit in order for that signal to pass. So ones that are not able to pass through the plasma membrane are either going to be large molecules or water soluble. Okay, you see that right here. They need to bind to a receptor on the outside of the plasma membrane. So, water soluble or large molecules cannot pass through the plasma membrane. I'm sorry. Cannot pass through the plasma membrane on their own. They need to use a membrane bound receptor. Other examples, large proteins, glycoproteins, polypeptides. Um, some smaller molecules like epinephrine and norepinephrine also bind to a receptor on the outside of the cell. And when they bind to this receptor, they cause changes to occur inside the cell. So we're gonna talk about that today, how these changes occur. Okay. Intracellular receptors. I'm gonna drink some coffee. I'm so sorry. Okay. So with intracellular receptors, these are receptors that are inside the plasma membrane, either in the cytoplasm or inside the nucleus itself. So these hormones are able to pass freely through the plasma membrane. Um, so they're usually, they're gonna be lipid soluble and small in size. So they pass through the plasma membrane. I don't know what my deal is. I'm so sorry for yawning. They pass through the plasma membrane and bind to a receptor inside the cell or inside the nucleus and cause changes to occur. So they will react with enzymes or they can cause transcription or translation to occur. So some examples of intracellular hormones that bind to intracellular receptors, thyroid hormones, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, aldosterone, and cortisol. And the majority of these, these are lipids, and many of them are variations of the cholesterol molecule. Okay, 
So this is a summary slide of things that you're going, of hormones specifically that you do need to know. And so the hormone is highlighted on the left. Okay. So only the ones that are highlighted in yellow do you need to know. So you need to know the hormone name, where the hormone is released from, and what its target tissue is. Okay. And we will talk specifically about many of these hormones in this chapter. Not all of them, but many of them will go in more depth with. So this is just a good summary slide of what you need to know. Um, this would be easy for you to put it on flashcards so that you can remember this easily. But this is a summary slide of what you need to know. And in addition to where they're found and what their target tissue is, they activate what we call G proteins. And so we're gonna talk about what G proteins are next. Okay, so we actually have video. I'm not gonna do this video, but so anytime you see it uh, underlined and it's just on a separate page, click on that and that's a link to a video, okay? So this, that video is, I think it's an Amoeba Sisters video and it's just talking about um, receptors and cell signaling. Okay, G proteins is where we need to spend some time and uh, get to know it. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, so, for example, we're gonna talk about glucagon. Okay, glucagon is a hormone that's released from the pancreas. And the receptors for glucagon are found in the liver cells and they're associated with G proteins. And so we're gonna, yes, we're gonna spend some time talking about G proteins. So when a glucagon hormone molecule binds to a glucagon receptor, we have a G protein that's associated with that receptor. There's three subunits, but one of the subunits, the alpha subunit, breaks apart from the rest of the G protein and binds to GD, GTP. I have a picture on the next slide that kind of helps illustrate this. Oh, sorry, my screen is acting up. For some reason, it's not letting me advance. Hold on, we're having technical difficulties. There we go. So after the GTP binds to the alpha subunit, it then binds to adenylate cyclase and activates it. So this whole cascade of reactions starts with glucagon binding to a receptor which activates a G protein, causes a portion of the G protein, the alpha subunit, to break apart and it causes activation of adenylate cyclase. What that does is it causes an increase in CAMP which is cyclic AMP and it activates protein kinase enzymes. <clears throat> and this whole series of reactions leads to the breakdown of glycogen in the liver, which causes the release of glucose from liver cells. So glucagon acts on the liver and through this series of reactions, causes the liver to release that stored glucose. Okay, so the next couple slides are about G proteins. Make sure you spend some time on this. And I do have a couple short videos to help with understanding G proteins. <clears throat> okay, so this is the same stuff that we just talked about, but it's in picture form now. So right here is our hormone, glucagon. It binds to a receptor in the plasma membrane. 
the G protein is made up of three subunits, the alpha, the gamma, and the beta. When the glucagon binds to that membrane protein, it causes the alpha subunit to break apart. And that alpha subunit then binds to GTP, so GTP, and that process causes ATP to convert to cyclic AMP. Oh, I forgot I had pictures. I don't need to draw all over this. Okay, you've activated cyclic AMP <clears throat> and there are two things that can occur. It can activate protein kinases and when it activates protein kinases it leads to the breakdown of glycogen and the release of glucose. So this is how glycogen causes glucose to be released from the liver. It goes through a series of steps using a G protein to activate this whole process. Then when it's time to deactivate cyclic AMP, phosphodiesterase inactivates cyclic AMP. And if this is inactivated, no more protein kinases are activated, no more glucose is broken down, and that process ends. Good, we got a lot of people here today. Okay, so we're going to watch a short video kind of explaining G proteins, and then we'll continue talking about G proteins. My link will work. Okay, hold on. We are having. Oh no. Okay, are you able to see the YouTube screen? Many G protein coupled receptors have a large extracellular ligand binding domain. Why will it not Many G protein stop? appropriate protein ligand binds to Okay, the one second. The receptor undergoes a conformational change that is transmitted to its cytosolic regions, which now. Okay. All right, are you able to see the video? Okay, so Jamie says no. Let me see what I can do here. Okay, can you see it now? Really? Okay, hold on. I will get this figured out. Okay, so people are saying yes. Still yes? Okay, here we go. Where's the, where's the play button? Oh my goodness. G protein coupled receptors go. have a large extracellular ligand binding domain. When an appropriate protein ligand binds to this domain, the receptor undergoes a conformational change that is transmitted to its cytosolic regions, which now activate a trimeric GTP binding protein, or G protein for short. As the name implies, a trimeric G protein is composed of three protein subunits called alpha, beta, and gamma. Both the alpha and gamma subunits have covalently attached lipid tails that help anchor the G protein in the plasma membrane. In the absence of a signal, the alpha subunit has a GDP bound and the G protein is inactive. In some cases, the inactive G protein is associated with the inactive receptor, while in other cases, as shown here, it only binds after the receptor is activated. In either case, an activated receptor induces a conformational change in the alpha subunit, causing the GDP to dissociate. GTP, which is abundant in the cytosol, 
can now readily bind in place of the GDP. GTP binding causes a further conformational change in the G protein, activating both the alpha subunit and beta gamma complex. In some cases, as shown here, the activated alpha subunit dissociates from the activated beta gamma complex, whereas in other cases, the two activated components stay together. In either case, both of the activated components can now regulate the activity of target proteins in the plasma membrane, as shown here for a GTP-bound alpha subunit. The activated target proteins then relay the signal to other components in the signaling cascade. Eventually, the alpha subunit hydrolyzes its bound GTP to GDP, which inactivates the subunit. This step is often accelerated by the binding of another protein, called a regulator of G-protein signaling, or RGS. The inactivated GDP-bound alpha subunit now reforms an inactive G-protein with a beta-gamma complex, turning off other downstream events. As long as the signaling receptor remains stimulated, it can continue to activate G-proteins. Upon prolonged stimulation, however, the receptors eventually inactivate, even if their activating ligands remain bound. In this case, a receptor kinase phosphorylates the cytosolic portions of the activated receptor. Once a receptor has been phosphorylated in this way, it binds with high affinity to an arrestin protein, which inactivates the receptor by preventing its interaction with G proteins. Arrestins also act as adapter proteins and recruit the phosphorylated receptors to clathrin coated pits from where the receptors are endocytosed. And afterwards, they can either be degraded in lysosomes or activate new signaling pathways. Okay, so that was, there's a lot of detail in there. So we're, you don't need to know that level, but it does kind of show how the G protein works, how um, we have a signaling cascade that occurs when you activate that G protein. So here is our next example we're going to talk about. And I think everyone's here. So before we, we delve into this slide, I'm going to take roll really quick. So when I call your name, please unmute yourself and speak up so I know that you are here, OK? I'm just writing it down. And it looks like almost everyone is here today, which is awesome. Kayla, are you here? Yes. Thank you. Reagan? Yeah, here. Thank, thank you. Kelsey? Kelsey Amal? Tana? Make sure I'm not missing any chats from you guys. Okay. Stevie, I see your comment. So you, I'm here. You're here. Josh? Here. Thank you. Joel? Here. Taylor Lobeda? Here. Thank you. Taylor Lavelle? Here. Thank you. Grace? Here. Andrew? Here. Amber. Amber Michael. Okay, is Jimmy here? I'm here. Thank you. When? I'm here. Thank you. Marissa? Here. Jamie? Here. Thank you. And Jeanette? Here. Okay. Morgan? Here. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Macy? Ayla?
Elijah. Here. Okay, thank you. Oriah. Here. Thank you. Ava. Here. Okay. Well, it looks like I have a comment from Ayla, so I know she's here. She just didn't speak up. Okay, so real quick, responding to the comments. Um, she couldn't find the PowerPoint for this lecture on Canvas. So let's just do a quick double check so that we can all see that. Go to Canvas, make sure I'm looking at the right class. Okay, so we go to Modules. Scroll down to the exam two section and your endocrine PowerPoint is right there. Okay, and below that, there's a bunch of links to videos. Oh, I see a comment, hold on. The exam, oh guys, thank you for saying that. It should now check. Someone check and see if it's visible for you now. Okay, good. Thank you, Jimmy. Okay, it is visible. It's there. I'm so glad you spoke up. So now you're able to see that, which is excellent. Okay. All right, we're going to go back to our PowerPoint now. So, activation of G protein. So we are gonna talk about an example with epinephrine. Oh, where did my pen go? Okay, there we go. Okay, DAG, glycerol causes the production of prostaglandins. So we're gonna talk about how that occurs, okay? So when prostaglandins are released, it causes smooth muscle contraction. If you remember, smooth muscle is not under voluntary control. This is, so for example, the uterus is smooth muscle. Um, in the intestinal system, the digestive system, that's lined with smooth muscle. Um, you don't get to control whether that contracts or moves. So if anyone has had a child, um, like I have, I have a 12 year old boy, um, going into labor, that triggering of smooth muscle contractions in the uterus is quite intense. Smooth muscle contractions can last a long time and they're very strong. Okay, so how does this whole process work? How do we trigger prostaglandins to be released. How does that cause smooth muscle contraction to increase? So it ultimately leads to the increase of calcium ions in the cytoplasm. It causes, causes calcium to be released. When calcium is released, it's able to trigger muscle contractions, which we'll talk about when we do muscle physiology. So we're not going to go in depth about how that works today. Okay. So we're going to go step by step. So first thing that happens is epinephrine binds to a receptor on a smooth muscle plasma membrane. Next, that triggers the G protein with those three subunits to dissociate. The alpha subunit moves away and it attaches to GTP. The next thing that happens, it doesn't show D GDP in this picture. The next thing that happens is it binds to phospholipase or phospholipase C. Okay, when that happens, so that's our alpha subunit, binds to phospholipase C, it acts on 
phosphoinositol and it's converted to inositol triphosphate right here. Inositol, so IP3, I'm not going to say it all the time. <laughs> inositol triphosphate, IP3, causes calcium ions to be released. Oops, sorry. Causes calcium ions to be released from the endoplasmic reticulum and opens calcium ion channels in the plasma membrane. Calcium ions directly regulate the activity of smooth muscle. Okay. Another response that occurs is DAG diacylglycerol is an enzyme that is also activated. And when this enzyme is activated, there we go. Those circles were out of order, I apologize. So when diacylglycerol DAG is activated, it regulates enzymes that increase the synthesis of prostaglandin. Prostaglandin directly acts on smooth muscle to cause muscle contraction. So through this process, you have two main things that are occurring. You have calcium ions from the endoplasmic reticulum and calcium ion channels open. And you have the production of prostaglandin and prostaglandin with calcium ions allows the smooth muscle contraction to occur. So here on the left of the screen, it walks you through the process that occurs. It's a good, if you can read through that and keep up with what each step is, it will really help you. But in a nutshell, that G protein, when it's activated, causes the alpha subunit to dissociate, which triggers a cascade of reactions that lead to, in this case, calcium ions being released and prostaglandin being synthesized. Okay, now we're gonna look at an example of G proteins with calcium ion channels. Okay, what do the alpha subunits attach to after separating? Good question, so let's back up. So in this case that we were looking at here, alpha subunit attaches to phospholipase C, C in this example, okay? In the previous, oh, if I have to go all the way back, woo. In the previous example where we were talking about glucagon, alpha subunit attaches to, this is adenylate cyclase. So in each example, it's attaching to a different It's attaching to a different molecule on the plasma, inside the plasma membrane. So it depends on what hormone binds to the receptor. And then when that alpha subunit dissociates, it binds to a specific molecule that's related to that receptor. Okay. Okay. All right. G proteins and calcium ion channels. So in this case, we have a hormone that binds to a receptor, causes the alpha subunit to separate. When we're talking about cal calcium ion channels, so when it separates, it's attached to GTP. GTP is attached to it. So number two here, when the alpha subunit with GTP bound to it, it attaches or binds to a calcium ion channel. When that alpha subunit with GTP binds to the calcium ion channel, it tells the channel to open. And then calcium ions are able to diffuse into the cell 
And in this case, they bind with a molecule called calmodulin. So the combination of calcium ions entering the cell and the activation of calmodulin causes changes to occur inside the cell. To deactivate this, number three down here, the phosphate is removed from GTP. So remember, GTP is attached. If you get rid of that phosphate, it becomes GDP, guanosine diphosphate, two instead of three. When that happens, the alpha subunit cannot stimulate that calcium ion channel to open anymore. So this is turning off that process. And so when GDP is converted to GDP, the alpha subunit rejoins to form the complete G protein again. So this is just how you activate the G protein to allow calcium ions to enter the cell through a calcium ion channel. So in all of these examples we've talked about so far, we have the same three components. We have a hormone, we have a receptor, and we have a G protein. That G protein, it's always the alpha subunit that separates and binds to GTP. That activates the alpha subunit, which then allows it to do its job and create change inside the cell, whether it's letting calcium ions in or increasing the production of prostaglandin. Um, this is how a G protein is activated and it has different actions inside the cell depending on what receptor binds to that membrane, membrane bound protein. Okay. So we have another short video. This is talking about inositol triphosphate and the calcium ion pathway. So this slide here specifically. So this slide, is, this is the video for that slide. So give me a sec so I can get our screen sharing going on. if it's going to open. It's taken a minute. Many G protein coupled receptors Oops. have a large extracellular ligand binding domain. When an appropriate protein ligand binds to this domain, the receptor undergoes a conformational change that is transmitted to its cytosolic. That is not the right video. Okay, hold on, I will find it. Oh man, I can't remember which one I watched. I think it's this one. Okay, are you able to see the screen? Anything your wild child does, Pampers Cruisers 360 Fit can too. With a stretchy waistband and adaptive 360 Fit. So they can move the way they okay, were born. Okay, awesome. First messengers are extracellular signaling molecules such as hormones or neurotransmitters. In response to exposure to these first messengers, intracellular signaling molecules called second messengers are released by the cell. Two such second messengers are IP3 and DAG. Calcium is also an important second messenger. Transient increases in cytoplasmic calcium ion levels are caused by the binding of some hormones and signal molecules. And this can send important intracellular signals by activating calcium binding proteins that then perform various functions. Note that cytosolic increases in calcium concentration can occur in two ways. Second messenger IP3 can open reservoirs of calcium within the cell, namely the endoplasmic reticulum and calcisomes. Otherwise, cyclic AMP can activate the opening of calcium channels in the plasma membrane so that extracellular calcium can rush in. 
G-protein coupled receptors, or GPCRs, are integral membrane proteins, meaning that they are locked into the cell membrane. They are locked in via seven transmembrane alpha helical segments. GPCRs recognize ligands through an extracellular recognition site. They also have an intracellular recognition site for a G protein. When a ligand binds the extracellular recognition site of a GPCR, this induces a conformational change, activating the G protein. There are different kinds of G proteins, sometimes also called membrane-associated heterotrimeric G proteins. GS activates adenylocyclase. GI inhibits adenylocyclase. GQ has three subunits, alpha, beta, and gamma. A conformational change in the GPCR activates the G protein. When this happens, the ADP on the G alpha subunit gets replaced by ATP. This drives dissociation of the G alpha subunit from the G beta gamma complex. The now free G alpha subunit can activate phospholipase C beta. Once it is activated by a G protein, phospholipase C beta can break down PIP2. Phosphatidylinositol 4P, or PIP, and phosphatidylinositol 4,5 biphosphate, or PIP2, are produced through successive phosphorylations of phosphatidylinositol, or PI. PIP2 is hydrolyzed by phospholipase C to produce inositol 1,4,5 triphosphate, or IP3, and diacylglycerol, or DAG, both of which act as second messengers. IP3 is hydrophilic and diffuses into the cell while DAG is lipophilic and hence remains in the cell membrane. IP3 binds to calcium channels on the endoplasmic reticulum, or the sarcoplasmic reticulum in the case of muscle cells, and allows release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum lumen. DAG, with the help of the calcium released from the endoplasmic reticulum, activates the calcium-dependent protein kinase C. Once activated, protein kinase C adds phosphates to target proteins and causes cellular responses. If you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe. You can also support me by following the link to my Patreon. Mm -hmm. Could I stop? All right, so that just kind of shows you a little bit more about. If you have any questions, okay, you'd stop. Like to I apologize. There we go. Okay, let's get us back to the right place. Okay, so this video is available for you to watch um, in addition to the links that are there on Canvas. Okay, so we're done talking about G proteins for now. We're going to talk about other ways that enzymes or receptors can actually alter in what's going on inside the cell. Okay, so a hormone, atrial natriuretic hormone, or ANH, which is a hormone you need to know, ANH, binds to a receptor. The receptor is on the plasma membrane, so ANH atrial natriuretic hormone is likely not lipid soluble because lipid soluble hormones are able to diffuse through the plasma membrane. And so it's either not lipid soluble or it's too large. That's why it needs to bind to a receptor on the outside of the plasma membrane. When it binds to a receptor, it activates cyclic GMP. So it converts GTP into cyclic GMP. When that occurs, it causes cyclic GMP, sorry, it causes sodium ion excretion by the kidney. If the kidney is excreting extra ions, especially sodium, water's gonna follow that. So that causes an increase in urine production. When you deactivate that, you have a molecule called phosphodiesterase. That inactivates cyclic GMP, which turns off the extra excretion of sodium ions, which reduces your urine output. 
So atrial natriuretic hormone works to control the fluid volumes in your body. Okay, here is another slide talking about which hormones you need to know. These are just like the slide before, hormones that bind to receptors that phosphorylate intracellular proteins. So just like what happened here, these hormones act in the same way. So you need to know the ones that are highlighted in yellow, the hormone, where they're found, what their target tissue is, and how they act. So um, that they bind to receptors that are linked to intercellular enzymes, okay? So we just talked about atrial natriuretic hormone. It's not as complicated as G proteins, which makes it a little easier to learn. Okay, next slide, there's only three of these. Again, you need to know the highlighted ones. These are lipid hormones. They bind to intracellular receptors. So these are hormones that are able to diffuse across the plasma membrane and bind to receptors inside the cell or inside the nucleus itself. So just the highlighted ones, where they're found, what their target tissue is, and what their effect is. Okay, intracellular receptors. Hormones can bind to receptors inside the cell, and this will activate genes. This will cause transcription and translation to occur. These proteins or enzymes that are inside the cell are responding, they, re they produce the response of that target cell to the hormone. Okay, so, there is always going to be a latent period for these hormones as they act. And this is because the hormone is binding to a receptor, let's say inside the nucleus, and it causes transcription and translation to occur. That takes time to make mRNA and to make protein, um, which then is released. So it takes time for that process to occur. This is limited by the breakdown of the receptor and hormone complex. So if that complex, if the receptor and hormone are broken apart, that stops the whole process. Okay, two hormones, two sex hormones, estrogen and testosterone, they produce different proteins in cells, okay? Um, and these result in different secondary sex characteristics in females and males. So secondary sex characteristics are those that you kind of develop during puberty. So the production of hair, um, breasts in, in women, um, enlargement of the gonads in males, um, facial hair, these are all secondary sex characteristics. Okay. Functions of the endocrine system. Endocrine system is involved in metabolism and tissue maturation, ion regulation. So we already talked about a brief example of atrial natriuretic hormone, which is directly involved in regulating ions which in turn regulates fluid volume levels in the body. So water balance. Immune system regulation. Heart rate and blood pressure regulation. Controlling blood glucose or other nutrients. So this would be through glucagon and insulin are directly controlling blood glucose levels. Controlling reproduction, fun reproduction functions. So your sex hormones like 
estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone all are controlling reproductive functions. And then there's hormones that are in control of uterine contractions and milk release. So prostaglandins are controlling uterine contractions and then prolactin and oxytocin, all three actually play a role in uterine contractions and or milk production and release. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about specific glands the hypothalamus. This is a place where the nervous system and the endocrine system interact, where they're basically combined. So the hypothalamus regulates the secretions of the anterior pituitary. Remember in class I told you that the hypothalamus produces releasing hormones? those releasing hormones act on the pituitary. So the pituitary, I'm so sorry. I'll drink some more coffee. The pituitary has two lobes to it. So it's kind of, it's kind of looks like this. So you have the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. The hypothalamus sends releasing hormones to the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary is under nervous system control. So essentially an extension of the hypothalamus. The anterior pituitary produces nine major hormones that are involved in regulating body functions and the secretion of other endocrine glands. Okay, so here's a better picture of the pituitary gland showing you the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. Now they're not different colored in, re in reality. You can't just look and say, oh, that's the division the anterior pituitary is larger and it's anterior to the second lobe or the posterior pituitary. So the posterior pituitary or another word for that is neurohypothesis. This is an extension of the hypothalamus. So it's part of the nervous system. It secretes neurohormones. The anterior pituitary, on the other hand, adenohypothesis, has three main regions to it. I'm not going to ask you about the regions, but it's just good to know that there are different regions to the anterior pituitary. So inferiorly, this large portion is the pars distalis. In the middle, pars intermedia. And then, oops, I went the wrong way, sorry. Then most superior is the pars tuberalis. Okay, I don't have, you don't have to worry about the handout. Okay releasing and inhibiting hormones. So we're still talking about the hypothalamus. Tropins or tropic hormones are hormones that regulate the hormone secretions of other endocrine tissues. Okay. All anterior pituitary hormones are tropins. So they all act on other endocrine glands and control their secretion of hormones. Okay, releasing hormones come from the hypothalamus. So here are some examples of releasing hormones. Gonadotropin releasing hormone or GHRH. 
This is causes the anterior pituitary to release growth hormone. So we don't have a lot of room here, but we have gonadotropin releasing GHRH causes the anterior pituitary to release growth hormone. Okay. Another example is the thyrotropin releasing hormone. This is released from the hypothalamus, acts on the anterior pituitary and tells it to release thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH. Okay. CRH or corticotropin releasing hormone released from the hypothalamus acts on the anterior pituitary and tells it to release adrenocorticotropic hormone. So these releasing hormones are named for the hormone that they cause to be released from the anterior pituitary. Okay. Gonadotropin releasing hormone released by the hypothalamus causes the anterior pituitary to release two specific hormones, FSH or follicle stimulating hormone and LH, luteinizing hormone. I don't know why I'm yawning. Okay, prolactin releasing hormone, PRH causes the anterior pituitary to release prolactin. Okay, then there are also inhibiting hormones. So one example is gonna growth hormone inhibiting hormone. Another word for that is somatostatin. So I know this word has come up in our lecture already. So growth hormone inhibiting hormone is the same as somatostatin. This tells the anterior pituitary to decrease the amount of growth hormone that's being released. Okay, then we also have, I'm sorry, we also have prolactin inhibiting hormone, or PIH released from the hypothalamus, causes the anterior pituitary to decrease the release of prolactin. Okay, so, so we're gonna go over specific hormones now. <clears throat> We've done a few and now we're gonna kind of go through specific hormones. So ADH, antidiuretic hormone, or another word for that is vasopressin. So how this all starts is there are special neurons in the hypothalamus called, called osmoreceptors. These monitor changes in osmolality, so the concentration of solutes in the blood, and in, yeah, in the blood. And these osmoreceptors will detect changes. So if the concentration of electrolytes dissolved in the blood increase, or the amount of water in the blood decreases, then antidiuretic hormone is stimulated to be released. This is being released from the posterior pituitary. So if concentration levels increase or fluid volume levels decrease, it will stimulate the release of antidiuretic hormone. Okay, there are also baroreceptors and these can be found in the heart, in large veins, in the carotid arteries, and the aortic arch. Their job is to detect changes, to detect changes in blood pressure. So barrow, think about a barometer. Barrow receptors are dealing with changes in blood pressure. So if blood pressure decreases, it triggers the release of antidiuretic hormone. And antidiuretic hormone is released, it acts on the kidney, 
and it tells the kidney to preserve more fluid, reduce the urine output, um, and thus keeping more fluid in the body. Okay, so involved with this whole antidiuretic hormone process, we're gonna go through the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanism. So first, looking down here at this illustration, antidiuretic hormone is made in the hypothalamus released from the posterior pituitary, okay? Renin, another important component, is made by the kidney. Angiotensin is made in the liver, and aldosterone is made by the adrenal glands that sit on top of the kidneys. Okay, so how does this work? You should have a slide, you should have it in your notes, your, um, your homework too. So this all starts with the release of angiotensin, which is made by the liver. Angiotensin works on renin, which is produced in the kidney. That converts angiotensin to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2, and this is where things get interesting. Angiotensin 2 triggers the release of aldosterone by the adrenal glands. Aldosterone tells the little tubes inside the kidney to reabsorb more sodium and more water. That causes the blood volume levels to decrease because you are, I'm sorry, to increase because you are saving extra water from the kidneys. So less is being put in your urine. The other action is it causes the release of antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary. This works on the kidneys as well, telling the kidney to reabsorb more water back into the bloodstream, so producing less urine again. It also causes arteries to constrict, which increases your blood pressure. <clears throat> so direct effects of this mechanism specifically, you have an increase in blood pressure, an increase in blood volume, and it also causes you to feel thirsty. So you drink more water. So this all starts with you not having enough fluid volume in your body and the osmolality is too high, causes the release of angiotensin in this whole cascade of reactions. Okay, here we're looking at the same, same slide, just a little bit different. So the liver produces angiotensinogen, the kidney produces renin, angiotensinogen is converted to angiotensin 1, and in the lungs, angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2. Ultimate response is it causes reabsorption of sodium into the bloodstream, which increases your osmolality. Well, water is going to diffuse by osmosis from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration in an effort to equalize the concentrations. So water is going to follow sodium out of the kidney tubules back into the bloodstream. So you are saving water. Okay. ANP, atrial natriuretic hormone. Atrial natriuretic hormone or atrial natriuretic pipe peptide causes the increase in plasma volume fluid stretches the atriums, atria, plural, in the heart. When those atria are stretched because there's extra fluid volume, it causes the release of ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide. 
what happens when this atrial natriuretic peptide is released, it inhibits the reabsorption of sodium. So more sodium is excreted from the kidneys. Water is going to follow that high, that high concentration. So water is going to leave the bloodstream and enter the kidney tubules, and that will cause to produce more production of urine. So you're getting rid of extra fluid with atrial natriuretic peptide. Okay, anterior pituitary hormones. Make sure we're doing good here. No questions. Now we have a question. Oh, I sure can. I will slow down. Thank you. Do I need to back up at all? Yes, please. Okay. Is there a particular slide that you want to see again? Or a topic? Just the last one. Okay. Atrial natriuretic peptide. So I'll give you guys a minute here to look at this and write down your notes. I'll drink my coffee. I'm so sorry for yawning this morning. Okay, to kind of help illustrate how atrial natriuretic peptide works, I'm gonna to try to draw a little picture here. So <clears throat> we have these tubes inside the kidney where we collect waste products and fluid. And then we also have, this is, this is gonna be a blood vessel, okay, vessel. And this is our tubes, tubule, okay? So what happens with A and P, actual natriuretic peptide, sodium is inside these tubules. Water from the blood vessels wants to go where the sodium is by diffusion. Remember, osmosis is the diffusion of water. So from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration, that's the direction water is going to flow. So atrial natriuretic peptide causes more sodium to stay in the tubes. So water is going to want to flow from the blood into these tubes. That leads to increased urine output. Okay, so this is water by diffusion flowing to areas that have a higher concentration, flowing out of the blood into these kidney tubules, which causes ultimately is an increase in urine volume, okay? Okay, we're gonna go to the next slide. Anterior pituitary hormones. Okay, growth hormone is an important anterior pituitary hormone. Another word for it is somatotropin. That's just for your information. I'm always going to refer to it as growth hormone. Another hormone is the thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH. I will always use the full term, but then inc include the abbreviation. It's because it is important that you know the abbreviation as well as the full term. 
Okay, adrenocorticotropic hormone. Melanocyte stimulating hormone, MSH. So these are, this is talking about the melanin in your skin. Okay. Beta endorphins, and we're really not going to spend much time talking about those. Lipotropins. Luteinizing hormone, that's a big one, especially when we talk about the reproductive system. And follicle stimulating hormone. Both of those are really important in the reproductive system. So we're going to talk about some of these hormones, not all of them. So the ones that we spend time talking about and we have specific information, that's where you're going to need to know those details. Okay. Oh, and then prolactin. And prolactin, kind of like the name hints at, has something to do with lactation. So it stimulates the production of milk in the mammary glands. Okay. So we're going to talk about growth hormone. What growth hormone does is it stimulates the uptake of amino acids. So taking in amino acids into the cell, that means you have more amino acids available for protein synthesis, for building. This is growth hormone. So this is directly involved in your body's ability to grow. Growth hormone also stimulates the breakdown of fat. So you can use fat as an energy source and it stimulates the synthesis of glycogen from your pancreas. Glycogen uses, it causes a breakdown of sugar from your liver. So it kind of saves glucose. Also causes bone and cartilage growth. So my son, for example, he's 12. He is growing like a weed at the moment. I swear in the last several months, he's grown several inches. And that's his, he's growing in length. His bones are growing in length and cartilage is growing as well. So this is causing, growth hormone is causing all of these changes to occur, which allows the buildup of the amino acids which help build muscle promoting bone and cartilage growth, breaking down fat to be used as energy. Um, growth hormone is doing all of these things. It also helps regulate blood levels of nutrients after a meal or after a period of not eating. Okay, so what happens when you have too much growth hormone or not enough? So with too much growth hormone, at, growth hormone as a child while your body is still growing can cause gigantism. And a really great example is Andre the Giant, may he rest in peace, um, is an example of gigantism. Dwarfism, on the other hand, many me over here, this is when you don't have enough growth hormone when you're a child. So you don't grow very much. So these are two disorders related to growth hormone when you were in that period of growth as a child. Please tell me you guys know about the Princess Bride. I just have to take a sidebar and mention that. Andre the Giant is in a very classic movie from the 80s called The Princess Bride. I know a lot of you are, are younger than me, but um, if you haven't seen it, I would recommend it. It's a classic. Okay, now I'm gonna move back on. Okay, what happens when you have too much growth hormone as an adult? That resulting condition is called acromegaly. And what it does is it causes um, 
facial features and hands to enlarge, it changes what you look like. So this top picture here, this is a woman over a period of probably 20 to 30 years. It shows how her nose has increased in size, her brows have enlarged, her chin has enlarged, and her hands have enlarged. When you see her 20 to 30 years later, she doesn't look at all like she, how she used to look. That's because there's too much growth hormone. And down here, we have a picture of a young man, probably over a period of 10 years, how it has changed facial features and how the hands have enlarged. And they don't look like the same person anymore. Okay, how is growth hormone stimulated? Okay, it is stimulated by growth hormone releasing hormone, GHRH, from the hypothalamus. Growth hormone releasing hormone from the hypothalamus triggers the release of growth hormone from the anterior pituitary. So remember the hypothalamus sends releasing hormones. And those releasing hormones travel a very small distance from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. Direct and indirect effects. The direct effect of growth hormone is that it binds to receptors on cells, causes changes inside the cell. What are the indirect effects that occur from growth hormone releasing hormone? Causes the liver and skeletal muscle to produce somatomedins. And these are insulin-like growth factors. These insulin-like growth factors bind to receptors on the membrane of target cells and cause these changes to occur. So it will stimulate the growth in cartilage and stimulate the growth in bone, increases the production of protein in skeletal muscle. So again, like my son, who is totally in a growth spurt, he's growing in height, so his cartilage and bones are growing, his muscles increasing, those are two big things that are happening during release of growth hormone. You probably hate it that I'm talking about him right now. He's at that age where he doesn't like that. Gotta love kids. I love my son. Okay, I'll give you guys a second and we'll go on to the next slide. Okay, how is growth hormone inhibited? The hypothalamus produces growth hormone inhibiting hormone. So not only does the hypothalamus produce growth hormone releasing hormone, it also produces growth hormone inhibiting hormone or GHIH. The other word for that is somatostatin. Somatostatin inhibits the release of growth hormone. Okay. Growth hormone releasing hormone is secreted in a response to these factors. So if your blood glucose levels decrease, growth hormone releasing hormone is secreted because one of the effects of growth hormone is to increase blood glucose levels. If you are under stress, it will be released. And it will be released in response to certain amino acids that are present. Okay. Growth hormone inhibiting hormone, somatostatin, is secreted when the blood glucose levels are high. So that inhibits the release of growth hormone, which stops the breakdown of blood glucose. And it actually causes the opposite of glucose to, to be stored in the cells of the body taken out of the blood. Okay, so Peak levels of growth hormone occur during deep sleep. This is why it's so important that kids get good amount of sleep every night 
that's when they're growing is when they're asleep. So the more sleep they get, the more they have the opportunity for their bodies to grow and develop. And they also just need the sleep to be able to function as well. So peak levels of growth hormone are during sleep time, deep sleep. So if you have kids or when you do have kids, make sure they're getting plenty of sleep so that they have the opportunity to grow and develop the way they should. Okay, we are just about done with time. So I'm not gonna start our next hormone. So we're gonna start with adrenocorticotropic hormone on Tuesday. Okay, um, looking forward, let's check our syllabus real quick. Let's go to That is not what I wanted to do. Okay, give me one second. I'm gonna share the right screen with you. Okay, hopefully you're looking at Canvas with me now. Let's look at our schedule. Oh, comments, can you see? Oh, good, some of you like it. Oh, Drew, you think it's over me? Oh, just kidding. Thanks, Drew, I appreciate the humor. <laughs> Great movie, I can quote it word for word. It's, it's fantastic. Okay, so looking forward, today is the 24th. Yeah, we're still way ahead. We're still ahead. So we're just taking our time with the endocrine system, which is totally fine because there's a lot of information for us to learn. So you have a quiz on Monday. Your quiz on Monday is going to be over nerve physiology, okay? So that is what your quiz is going to be over. So quiz four, nerve physiology on Monday. I will have that quiz up by Sunday and I will send out an announcement when it is ready for you to take. And it will be due by Monday at midnight. Are there any questions about today or looking forward um, for next week? Oh, I see there's some questions. Okay, is exam, is exam stew, bleh, I can't talk. Is exam two still over the cell through the endocrine system? Yes. Um, we will be able to finish the endocrine system by next week. So it will be through the cell through the endocrine system. So we will be caught up. Um, will we ever have a review day or a review period where we briefly touch on harder topics again? Yes. So we are ahead right now. What I would like to do is, um, let's see, look at our schedule here. Monday will likely finish the endocrine system. So we will be able to review that next week. And I would recommend bringing questions with you, write things down, and then we will spend some extra time going over these tougher topics, okay? Um, and since you have your quiz on Monday, which is gonna include nerve physiology, um, if you wanna bring questions to class, or actually in Canvas, I believe you're able, to, let me check something really quick. Okay, so between now and your quiz, I would send questions to me and I'll post the questions and the answers so that everybody can have those answers, okay? Can we play Kahoot with review questions? 
I don't know what Kahoot is. Is this a, somebody has to tell me what Kahoot is. Do I need to look Kahoot up? It's kind of like Jeopardy. Oh. Okay, I'll look that up today and see if I can figure it out and put that together. Okay, I'll see what I can do. What um, everyone logs in and does it on their phone. Okay, is this an app? Any electronic? Is this an app that I can download on my phone or is this something I put on my computer? It's like Zoom except you give us questions. It's a website. Okay, I will look into that tonight and see if I can get that figured out. Um, it sounds like a fun idea. It really does. So I will see what I can do about that. Um, that's an excellent idea. It's fun and it helps. Okay, I will do my best to see if I can get that worked out, especially um, for the endocrine system, which is coming up, because I know there's a lot of information there. So if you guys want to help me, send me question ideas that you think would be helpful. Um, help is always great. Questions that you have about the nervous system, have about the endocrine system, and I will incorporate that into the Kahoot. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments about today and looking forward? Okay, we're good. All right. Then I'm going to end for today. Thank you so much. It was a great class period. I am so sorry for yawning. I don't know what my problem is. It's morning. Um, I hope you have a fantastic day. And remember, your quiz is going to be Monday. I will post it when it's ready. And then if you have questions about um, the nervous system or the endocrine system, or you want questions included in the cahoots, send them to me and I will compile a list. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great day.